Uh, okay, everybody, welcome. Um, thanks for coming. My name is Jonathan Brown. This is an event that's uh, co-sponsored by the Abu Lee Bitsal Center for Muslim Christian Understanding and our Bridge Initiative on the Study of Islamophobia. And uh, I'm. This is a. We're really. It's a coup for us to get Arjun here because the stuff he uh, focuses on is uh, very much in the news and. For people who are thinking ahead for the next couple of years, uh, issues of great uh, concern. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure people have a lot, will have a lot of questions about the past, the present, and the future of, thi- of issues of um, civil liberties and also countering violent extremism questions, these measures that have been used by the government for the last couple of years. Arjun uh, Singh Sethi is a civil rights lawyer, writer, and teacher based in Washington, D.C., He's currently Director of Law and Policy at the Sikh Coalition and previously served as the National Legislative Council at the American Civil Liberties Union, where I was a uh, small but regular donor. Very small, monthly. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Dr. Spazito knows my tipping habits. So uh, he is also adjunct professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center and Vanderbilt University Law School, where he teaches courses on policing, Profiling and surveillance. Uh, he's been invited by numerous law enforcement agencies, including the FBI and the CBP, to preview intelligence programs prior to launch. Arjun has published more than 40 columns in national media outlets, including Los Angeles Times, Politico, USA Today, the Washington Post, and his work has been widely cited, including by the New York Times, Yale Law Journal, and CNN. Uh, thanks very much. We usually, you know, have half an hour, 40 minutes of talking, and then plenty of time for Q&A. So please go ahead and thank you very much for coming. Fantastic. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm uh, very excited to be here um, uh, to talk about these uh, uh, issues of great importance. Um, how many of you all have heard of the talk, what Charles Blow, uh, an op-ed uh, columnist of the New York Times, calls the talk? Um, I heard of it. Great. Um, so the talk uh, refers to the idea that African-American parents um, have to speak to their children um, at a very young age about how they are acutely vulnerable to discrimination, to inequities in almost every facet of American life. Um, It could be housing, uh, employment, wage discrimination, police violence. Um, It's my belief uh, and my contention today Um, that Muslim Americans, Arab Americans, uh, and many from South Asian communities increasingly have to have their own talk with their children about how they too are acutely vulnerable uh, to various forms of inequities. Uh, And today I'm going to focus uh, uh, in particular on criminalization, on profiling. Because if we look at um, uh, 9-11, Although Muslim, Arab, uh, Sikh, South Asian Americans were vulnerable to profiling, uh, to things like hate violence before 9-11, we've seen an absolute uh, uh, unfathomable uh, acceleration of criminalization since that time. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about criminalization and various mechanisms uh, that law enforcement and the intelligence community use to criminalize innocent Muslim Americans, and then talk a little bit about some of the other civil rights challenges that our communities face, including uh, hate violence and bullying. Um, I'll start by focusing on the racial profiling guidance promulgated by the Department of Justice uh, in 2014. How many of you have heard of uh, the DOJ's racial profiling guidance? few people in the back. Um, so I would say this is probably the most important criminal justice document in America that nobody has heard of. Um, it purports to outline the circumstances under which various federal law enforcement agencies and state and local law enforcement can profile, can engage in intelligence uh, operations. Um, And this was promulgated in late um, uh, 2014, and it was uh, the outcome of seven years of negotiation at the time I was at the ACLU uh, between civil rights groups and the government. And the final product was extraordinarily disappointing. Uh, 
So for example, this guidance specifically allows for the TSA and Customs and Border Patrol to profile on the basis of faith, race, LGBT status, or any other protected category. Let's pause for a second. Does anybody know the largest law enforcement agency in America times five? Yeah. Uh, CBP, Customs Border Patrol, um, um, over 100,000 agents, and their jurisdiction extends 100 miles inward, right? So believe it or not, um, it's something like 40% of America actually falls, right? 40% of the American population actually falls within CBP's jurisdiction if you include that 100-mile radius. So again, just something to consider. This guidance specifically allows uh, for profiling by CBP, by TSA, which means that, go ahead. Does that mean 100 miles from any international airport? It means 100 miles from a border. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, um, or again, CBP has jurisdiction, for example, um, uh, in some cases at airports, which means that the TSA, if you're at an airport, um, they can pull you aside for any reason at all. No reasonable suspicion needed, no probable cause needed, they can just do it. Um, the guidance also exempts, or I should say is silent on state and local law enforcement under the theory that state and local police are best suited to determine when profiling is appropriate and when it's not, right? So the Department of Justice thus punted they had an opportunity to say to state and local law enforcement, especially in the wake of, uh, of, of what we saw and what we've seen in places like Ferguson and then later in Baltimore and elsewhere, um, that profiling is, is anti-American, uh, that profiling isn't consistent with civil rights or constitutional rights, um, and yet they punted. Um, so while localities can pass their own measures prohibiting profiling, uh, the federal government um, passed on the opportunity uh, to preclude them from doing so. Um, the guidance also allows the use of confidential informants absent any kind of suspicion. Any kind of suspicion, right? So the idea that you can hire um, um, uh, a Muslim American, an Arab American, or convince a Muslim American who might be p facing a uh, a, a terrorist charge of some kind or another, and tell them that in exchange, right, for not prosecuting you, we want you uh, uh, to be what's called a, a raker in a community, right? We want you to, to penetrate mosques. We want you to penetrate student associations uh, without any evidence of wrongdoing, just because we want to gather intelligence. Related to that, the government also, the Department of Justice, specifically in verbatim allowed for intelligence gathering programs similar to the NYPD demographics mapping program that was revealed by the Associated Press some years ago. Does anyone know a little bit about the NYPD demographics mapping program? Does someone want to tell me a little bit about it? Well, where, excuse me, voice, where the police decided to have informants in the mosque to keep track of what's going on in the mosque and the Muslim community. Absolutely. Um, so this was a, uh, uh, an, uh, 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 we actually don't even know the, the exact size of it, but suffice to say, a gargantuan intelligence collection program um, that was not based on time-tested principles like the presumption of innocence, uh, like individualized suspicion like clear and convincing evidence, like probable cause. I'm a lawyer, you don't have to be a lawyer, but you can understand the significance of those concepts, right? The idea that we have the right to privacy, the idea that we have the right to political speech, we have the right to religious expression, right? Without fearing uh, 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 surveillance, without fearing this type of government intrusion. And yet this program purported to actually just map all of New York's Muslim American community. Um, cafes, Muslim-owned businesses. Um, and when I say cafes, it wasn't just Muslim-owned cafes. The NYPD would stake out 
uh, cafes that uh, uh, would play Al Jazeera news or play soccer matches. Um, in one case, um, I think it's um, Chelsea the, in, in the Premier League play at uh, uh, the Etihad Stadium, and there was confusion, and they were like uh, 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 surveilling uh, New York City cafes that were playing Chelsea games because they somehow thought that there could be this connection uh, to the Gulf. Muslim student associations, charities. Uh, there's a case um, um, uh, of a particular individual um, um, who ran a charity called Muslims Giving Back. And uh, it's, he's one of the clients in the NYPD mapping case uh, that the, that's represented um, that CCR and the ACLU are, are litigating. And um, he ran this charity. And an NYPD informant penetrated the charity group and befriended him and actually stayed at his house. And he later found out that this individual um, who purported, um, uh, who suggested he wanted to be part of this charity was actually just spying on this group. No evidence of wrongdoing. And of course, donations to this charity plummeted. But the DOJ guidance specifically allows for this type of intelligence operation. So I'd like to start there because it provides this sort of, this, 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 this permissive environment of profiling of stigma, of, of, of otherness, uh, that cannot be ignored. Um, I'll now move to CVE, Countering Violent Extremism Programs. Um, countering Violent Extremism Programs um, are, are predominantly led by the FBI, um, and they spring from the assumption and from the desire that law enforcement has the ability to identify Muslim American youth who are at risk of becoming violent extremists. So for example, the first iteration of the program um, were three pilot initiatives that were launched in Boston, Los Angeles, and Minneapolis. And what the FBI did was, the FBI told uh, leaders in the Muslim American community to be the eyes and ears of law enforcement, right? And to keep an eye out for suspicious activity uh, that might be indicative of violent extremism and to share it with law enforcement. Now that might seem innocuous, but it's not. Um, first and foremost, um, again, uh, Muslim American youth uh, have the right to privacy. They have the right to be left alone. And what we found uh, was that the activities that community leaders were reporting to law enforcement were activities protected by the First Amendment. So we had situations where you know, Muslim Americans would uh, uh, post controversial articles on Facebook, um, uh, protest dr uh, drone strikes, um, express a newfound interest in religiosity. Those are all fundamentally American things. right? Those are all constitutionally protected activities. Yet they were somehow construed as indicators of violent extremism. And that's in large measure because at the time, Lisa Monaco, um, who was, or I believe still is, uh, one of President Obama's chief national security advisors, actually spoke about indicators and what the government was looking for. And some of the indicators she spoke about included ideological differences, uh, becoming confrontational at home, um, speaking suspicious languages and wanting to travel to uh, conflict zones overseas. What's considered a conflict zone? What if you have family in Lebanon? What if you have family in Yemen, in Saudi Arabia, in Pakistan, India, Indonesia? Um, so that was the first iteration. Um, and, and, and those are just some of the critiques, right? I mean, on a, on also on a very basic level, community leaders should be the eyes and ears of the youth, right? They shouldn't basically be serving constructively as informants for law enforcement. Um, the FBI then uh, um, uh, created a program called Don't Be a Puppet. Um, that is still active. Um, it's, it's, you can go to it online. It's almost like a web portal, like a video game. And through that program, again, they ask youth um, uh, at schools and teachers to, again, um, suss out uh, and identify uh, Muslim American students who are at risk of becoming violent extremists. And, and my suggestion to you is uh, teachers and students uh, uh, have no way uh, of identifying youth who are at risk of becoming violent extremists. They're not trained in it. And furthermore, there are no universal indicators. Anybody who's actually looked at this has found that there are no universal indicators to becoming a violent extremist, um, that it's a very individualized process. Um, that's all I'll say about CVE for now. 
Um, I'm going to revisit it later when I talk about, I think, what we can express, uh, what we can expect going forward. Um, watch lists. So according to the State Department, um, there's something in the realm of tens of thousands of known terrorists. But if you look at the FBI master terrorist watch list, uh, it has roughly 700,000 people on it. Um, and we know this because of documents that were leaked um, to The Intercept, the national security outlet, um, a few months ago. And the standard to getting on the watch list is extraordinarily broad. You can be branded a terrorist and put on the watch list if you are either a known terrorist or if there is reasonable suspicion to believe that you are a suspected terrorist, right? I don't even really know what that means. Reasonable suspicion to believe that you are a suspected terrorist. But what I can tell you is, is that you can be branded a terrorist under the guidance on the basis of a single social media post. One Facebook post is enough. And again, we know that Dearborn, Michigan, right? A, uh, a city with fewer than 100,000 residents has more watch listed residents than any other city in America except for New York, right? Very little due process protections. Um, the ACLU is in the process of negotiating a mechanism to challenge um, uh, your designation uh, as, a, uh, uh, as a person on the no-fly list, uh, but that's just one sub-list of this master terrorist watch list. Um, and increasingly, and unfortunately, people are starting to use the watch list um, as a proxy for other criminal justice issues. So this example of no fly, no buy, right? The idea that the no fly list is reliable and the idea that we might be able to use it to determine who has access uh, uh, and who has the right to carry arms. Um, suspicious activity reporting. If you look at the 9-11 Commission report, um, one of the failures um, that the Senate identified was the inability of local law enforcement to report suspicious activity reporting, uh, sorry, to report suspicious activity uh, to federal law enforcement. Um, the idea that maybe local law enforcement, you know, sees things um, that national agencies like the FBI miss and that we've got to create a mechanism for local law enforcement to pass along this information to national uh, federal law enforcement agencies like the FBI. So um, the government created uh, the suspicious activity reporting. And the idea is uh, local law enforcement are asked to report activities that they believe are indicative of pre-terrorism planning or otherwise suspicious to what are called fusion centers, right, which serve as these intermediary centers who then vet this content, vet these reports, and then pass it along to the FBI so that it can be investigated. Again, just like CVE programs and trying to determine who is at one day be risk of becoming a countering, risk of becoming a violent extremist, um, what exactly is pre-terrorism planning? I'll tell you. These are the plaintiffs who are currently being represented by a group of national civil rights organizations. Muslim Americans who bought pallets of water from Costco, searched for video games online, and have taken photos of national monuments and, brid and bridges, and I'm forgetting my favorite one, right. A Muslim American who steps foot into a Best Buy and place places a large purchase order for home computers for his home business, right? Those are the types of activities that have been construed as suspicious activity. Again, we don't know the depth of the program. What I gave you were instances uh, that we know about because these are plaintiffs in an actual case. But bear in mind uh, and remember that there are likely thousands and thousands of these reports uh, and individuals who have been affected by a program like this. Um, continuing down the, uh, 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 down the map, um, NSA surveillance. 
So I think it's safe to say um, we live in a world where everyone is being watched, but some, I would submit, are being watched more than others, particular Muslim Americans. So we know for a fact, um, thanks to documents uh, 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 leaked by Edward Snowden, that the NSA was monitoring um, the email correspondence of the executive director for the Council for American Islamic Relations, Nihad Awad. We know that. Uh, we also know that the NSA was monitoring uh, email communications um, um, from prominent Muslim Americans who actually served as Republican strategists. And in particular, under the 702 program, that's an overseas intelligence collection program run by the NSA, the government has taken the position that they can capture any communication to a non-American located overseas who possesses foreign intelligence. Foreign intelligence is defined to include foreign affairs, right? Which is why the NSA has taken the position that they have the authority to monitor and capture the communications of Human Rights Watch, Abroad, The Guardian, Al Jazeera, Amnesty International, right? We know Oxfam. We know that a lot of those communications have been captured because there's a case, right? Clapper v. Amnesty International, I suggest you read it. Um, and again, when you think about that, when you think about the agents and the institutions and the individuals who are being targeted overseas, um, that often disproportionately leads to Muslim Americans and people in America uh, who are from our various communities uh, being monitored and being censored. So for example, I'm an American. If I email somebody who works at The Guardian in the UK, right, about a Muslim civil rights issue, that email will end up being captured under the 702 program. Um, looking forward, um, I think it's safe to say, are we doing on time? Um, I think it's safe to say that you will see an intensification of all of what I just described under the Trump administration. Um, I think you will see probably larger loopholes in the DOJ guidance. I think you will see intensification of CVE programs, uh, expansion of watch lists, uh, expansion of suspicious activity reporting. I also think um, you will see um, efforts to uh, further entrench the surveillance powers uh, and authorities of, of, of national intelligence agencies like the NSA. I also think you will see a resurgence um, uh, in two particular programs uh, that I'd now like to pivot to. One is material support. Um, so under Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project, it's a Supreme Court case, the Supreme Court in a 5-4 decision held that teaching a terrorist how to negotiate peacefully is considered material support of terrorism. Right? That is how extraordinarily expansive the material support laws of the United States can be construed. And that's one of the reasons that there are almost no U.S. charity organizations, right, including the Catholic Church, who are active in places like Syria, in Iraq, uh, in, in other places, uh, you know, in the Middle East, because they are so worried about running afoul of the material support laws. So, for example, there was concern among people at the Council of American Islamic Relations a few months ago about whether um, writing an open letter to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, right, the founder of ISIS, would be about, about how he was perverting Islam, could be construed as material support of terrorism, right? Under the theory, right, that you are engaging with somebody who is a known terrorist, right? You are imparting and sharing knowledge with somebody who is a known terrorist, and whether that could be construed as material support, because you are, again, imparting that knowledge, and imparting that knowledge, you are freeing up time for him to do other things, like engage in terrorism. Um, so it's my understanding that the Obama administration has actually taken the position that that expansion of the material support laws um, um, uh, is a little too opaque. 
um, and they have encouraged U.S. attorneys uh, to be very sparing in how they use the material support laws. But I think you will see under the Trump administration much less hesitation, much less hesitation to use this extraordinarily broad uh, legal rubric uh, to go after um, uh, a whole host of, of Muslim institutions, Muslim entities, um, uh, you know, who are politically active in one form or another. Um, the other program I talk about is NSEERS, um, which stands for the National Security Entry Exit uh, Re-Entry System. I think I got that right. So NSEERS was a program that was promulgated by President Bush, um, and it required individuals who were in the United States on a temporary basis, so students, tourism, et cetera, from 25 countries. Um, I think all of the countries are Muslim majority, except for North Korea, to register with the US government, um, to submit to onerous interviews, to check in, to engage in various follow-up. Um, uh, it required them uh, and limited their ability to leave the country only from certain designated you know, ports of entry, um, et cetera. Um, it's sort of akin to what people are now calling this Muslim registry. Um, I want to say that in 2003 alone, um, tens of thousands, I think it's close to 80, more than 80,000 uh, Muslims in the United States and South Asians uh, uh, and, and people from these various countries registered with the U.S. government. And um, the consequences were, as you might imagine, uh, disastrous. Um, broke up families. There were Muslims who didn't know they had to register because the guidance wasn't clear. Um, there were many who were deported. Um, there were uh, um, um, others from these countries who just bothered not to emigrate. Um, and again, it sort of cultivated and furthered this environment of fear, of stigma, um, associated with the Muslim American and just Muslim community generally. Um, and again, you have to think about it in the context of the broader war on terror. You know, at the very same time this was happening, um, you know, the United States was, was torturing um, 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 uh, 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 individuals detained abroad in Abu Ghraib um, and elsewhere. Um, so I think you will see um, uh, that program revitalized. The Obama administration, they dis they, this is what they did. They discontinued the program, but they never delisted the 25 countries. Um, so President Obama hopefully um, will abandon the regulations entirely. But I do think you will see something uh, uh, very similar uh, proposed and, and, and implemented uh, by the Trump administration that might even be uh, more expansive. So I've tried to kind of walk you through these various programs, right, that criminalize and securitize the law, law enforcement's relationship with the Muslim American community in particular. Um, individually, they're extraordinarily troubling. And when you think about them in aggregate, right, I would submit you understand why hate violence against Muslim Americans, uh, and my colleagues in the Bridge Initiative can help me here, is roughly seven times higher now, right, than it was pre-9-11. Um, because Muslim Americans, uh, in particular, um, have largely been treated as the other. Um, and, you know, I mean, even when you think about something like the media, I like to pose this question sometimes. You know, when was the last time you, you saw a television show um, with a Muslim American protagonist who had any kind of death? Can you think of anything in five seconds? <laughs> It breaks the rule because then you have more than five seconds. But I said, when was the last time you saw a television show, right, with the Muslim American protagonist who had any type of character death? Little Mosque on the Prairie, that's like the rare exception. There you go. It is Canadian. Yeah, yeah. Um, right, so um, I think in many ways, hate violence um, um, uh, is a symptom of this stigma. Um, uh, of this sort of media exclusion. Um, and one of the fears going forward is really uh, going to be that, 
you could have uh, a sessions run DOJ that isn't interested in actually enforcing hate crime laws, right? You can gather, gather all the data you want, right? But if you have a Department of Justice who isn't committed, right, to enforcing hate crime laws, right, a civil rights division who isn't committed to actually combating discrimination, combating inequities, um, it's going to create a lot of, a lot of issues. Um, I will say that there is uh, legislation that is being contemplated that would create a federal civil right of action for victims of hate crimes. So if you are a victim of, hate, of a hate crime, you would be able to actually bring a federal civil right cause of action against the aggressor for money damages, and that would be a mechanism to actually hold the DOJ to account if they are hesitant to bring criminal charges because there would be simultaneous civil litigation pending. Uh, and I think uh, some of our, our, our Democratic uh, colleagues in the Senate deserve credit for coming up with that idea and, and trying to encourage uh, uh, others to sign on to it. Um, the last point I'll just make, because I think it's important and people don't talk about it, is just bullying. Um, I look at bullying as a major civil rights issue, and for whatever reason, people don't. Uh, we now understand and recognize and acknowledge uh, uh, the fact that we all have the right um, to go to a workplace and not experience discrimination on the basis of who we are. Uh, and if that happens, right, a lot of programs, a lot of, uh, of institutions and employers have a no tolerance policy. When it comes to something like bullying, um, it's something like Muslim and Sikh Americans are bullied at um, roughly t two to three times the national average. Um, and it spikes, just like hate violence spikes during election cycles and after mass shootings. And I think we need to be thinking about bullying as a civil rights issue uh, because bullying often, it's, hate violence and, and sort of hate speech often starts in schools, right? If our kids aren't speaking respectfully to one another and it's left untreated there, right, it's going to fester, uh, it's going to deteriorate. Uh, uh, into something far more nefarious. Um, I do think there's been some progress there because increasingly we are talking about it as a public health crisis. So for example, uh, there is a movement uh, nationwide to actually have pediatricians, right, ask students, youth, um, uh, their clients, if they are victims of bullying, right? So if you are an adult and you're about to go to a physical, often in the questionnaire there's a question about uh, whether you are a victim of domestic violence, right? Because there are extraordinarily long-term health consequences to that. So increasingly, pediatricians are asking youth uh, the question whether they are the victim of bullying, um, because we found that bullying correlates not just with things you would imagine, um, absenteeism, uh, a poor academic uh, performance, truancy, uh, but low self-esteem, um, um, uh, poor physiological outcomes, um, poor health, and I think uh, the movement there is, um, um, is good. I'll conclude by saying this, because I think it'll help orient us maybe sort of going forward. You know, when thinking about the criminalization policies, um, for me, I always start um, uh, with sort of the, the, the moral righteousness argument, right? Are these, are these programs constitutional? Um, do these programs unfairly infringe upon civil liberties? Do these programs violate time-tested human rights standards? But I'll also ask, because I think it's important, are they commensurate with the threat posed? Right? We know this fact. You are far more likely to die at the hands of a white violent extremist than you are to die at the hands of a Muslim violent extremist. Right? Yet CVE programs right, almost never target. Not that, it would, not that it would make them OK, to be clear. It wouldn't, because I'd have the same civil liberties uh, uh, concerns. But CVE programs don't tar target that community, right? Even suspicious activity reporting, watch list, right? We have this whole criminal uh, uh, intelligence apparatus um, that disproportionately, acutely impacts Muslim Americans uh, uh, and Muslims who happen to be in America. Um, and there is shockingly little evidence that they actually pose um, a disproportionate threat. Um, so I'll end there. I think I've taken just about 30 minutes or so. Uh, and I look forward to um, um, 
an enjoyable conversation. You should feel free to ask me about anything that I spoke about. Um, I also do work on the intersection of sort of the war on crime and the war on terror and a lot of work on surveillance. So uh, I'm yours. Any questions you have, I'm, I'm happy to address.